So I, I want to welcome everyone here. Uh, my name is uh, Graham Gagnon. I'm the, the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture and Planning at Dalhousie, and I'm, I'm thrilled uh, to have many of you here today uh, for a discussion on um, uh, in a ch climate change engagement series. In today's uh, series, we're, we're talking about the built environment and uh, driving to no towards net zero, and really pleased to, to have you here today. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we uh, uh, are in Mi'kma'ki, um, the unceded uh, territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and uh, the, at Dalhousie, uh, we, we recognize the uh, treaties that were signed and acknowledge that we are all treaty people. Um, I want to, uh, before we begin, I want to really acknowledge and thank our colleagues at Halifax, who uh, Shannon and Sarah, ha who have been an amazing job in, in working with us uh, in the faculty in providing uh, this lecture series and providing uh, a tremendous amount of leadership and guidance in planning this for our team. I also want to thank Clean Foundation uh, for helping us uh, organize and plan this event. Uh, it's been uh, certainly uh, appreciated on our side to have Clean's uh, support throughout this engagement. So as I said, uh, today's uh, discussion is on uh, net zero uh, uh, design. Um, this week alone, I think I've sat in two uh, different sessions to, to discuss net zero design and net zero building. It is a, an important topic that faces uh, Nova Scotians, Canadians, as we transition uh, from a, a fossil fuel based uh, economy to a clean economy and an acknowledgement of the significant amount that uh, the, the built environment uh, captures in, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions or producers, I should say. Um, so without further ado, I would like to uh, invite my colleague, uh, Shannon, uh, to the stage from Halifax, uh, the director of uh, the climate change group with the city of Halifax. And uh, again, I cannot thank Shannon and, Ki and Sarah enough for their support. So please, Shannon. Thank you, Graham. It's really exciting to be back here for a third uh, third one of these public lecture series. Really grateful to Dalhousie and to Clean for uh, partnering on something like this. We recognize that December is a tricky time. We're still really happy with the turnout that we're getting. We are recording every session so it can live on and be viewed by others as well. And there's been a lot of really great learning uh, in the first couple of sessions and I'm really excited about this one. I'm just gonna say briefly that you know, our climate plan is founded in science. It's really ambitious because it's gonna do, it's calling for what is necessary to stay within our carbon budget, which we're on track to overshoot by 2027 under a business as usual type of scenario. Um, and to try and get to net zero by 2050 in our current local HRM Halifax context. Uh, not assuming any silver bullets uh, with the information provided from utilities when we were doing the modeling work. So the absolute single biggest opportunity for driving emissions down in this city right now and moving forward is in the built environment. It's in retrofitting our existing building stock and that is all buildings across the city residential, commercial, industrial, all of it, multi, um, everything. So that's a really large challenge and we've been struggling with uh, how to really move the needle forward on deep energy retrofits. How do you make the business case? How do you get the property owner to say yes? How do you prove the technology? How do we scale up to be doing 5,000 retrofits a year from two years ago to 2040 was the target, was really what we would have to do with sh in the modeling work. Um, now, of course, things change and hopefully our grid will green faster than anticipated and all types of other things. Um, but knowing what we know now with solutions that we have now, this is our single biggest opportunity. We have great minds here to talk about the built environment. Um, and it's not just mitigation, it's also resilience. So as a city, we're trying to come up with a program we've been dubbing as R3, which is 
uh, deep energy retrofits, renewable energy, but also resilience to climate impacts. So when you go into a building, you look at all of those pieces together, so it's less disruptive, you don't have to go in five different times. And ideally, we're, we're fortifying our buildings against extreme weather um, and other impacts, and we're also driving the emission down throwing solar on where it makes sense, et cetera. So really, really excited for today. Um, and then our last session, I'll just mention briefly, is on the 16th of December. And uh, I'm super excited about that one as well because we're really trying to get at unsticking what is very, very much stuck on climate action in the city from a lot of different perspectives. And we're talking about transformational systems change and what does that mean and how do we actually get started. So hopefully you have room in your calendars for that. I know it's getting close to the holidays. So I will kick it over to Sarah Thompson to say a little bit about the format. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. So again, we envisioned this lecture series as a kind of a two-way conversation. So we have some amazing speakers, I think, who are pointing to the future, and we're really excited to kick it over in just a moment. And then we are going to have a little time for dialogue amongst the audience, um, and then some more time for kind of engagement and back and forth with the panel. And we are going to crowdsource some ideas at the end. So that's going to basically be the agenda. And I'm uh, very happy to have Lara Ryan here, who's going to be kind of moderating the panel. And so I'm just going to kick it over to Lara, who is a sustainability consultant working to promote climate action in the, build, in the building sector through stakeholder engagement, policy engagement, and implementing environmental sustainability goal strategies. And um, yeah, it's been a great pleasure to be collaborating with Laura in lots of lots of different ways. She's like a real hero in this movement. And so thank you for moderating today. <laughs> My fan club, yes, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Sarah, and welcome, everybody. I think this is a, a great opportunity for us to continue the conversation, and I feel like we've been having lots of conversations, and I see lots of you in the audience that have been participating in industry roundtables uh, recently, and, and that's, uh, that's a really good thing, and I think we need to continue to find ways to do that and to learn from each other. And I, I've said um, recently that uh, this collaborative... Um, um, feeling that, that I get the sense of that's very different than working in business 15 years ago. It, you know, it seems like we're in a much more collaborative state and, and people are willing to share more and learn from each other more and that's really good because it's the only way that we're going to tackle this huge problem. You know, Shannon just saying 5,000 retrofits a year and, and it's like that's so huge. How are we going to do it? And the only way we're going to do it is work together. So um, we've got amazing speakers here and I guess what we're going to do is go through some presentations, right? Sarah, does everybody have slides? Yeah, and we're gonna start with James Foran at Dow. Um, do I have an intro thing for people? <laughs> <laughs> I I'm just, I, or you can introduce yeah, yourself yeah. or I can read your little bio. Um, <laughs> sorry, hi guys. <laughs> I know a little bit about you, James, but I'm sure yeah. I don't know all the no. great stuff about you, so. Uh, James uh, Foran is an Associate Professor of Architecture and Director, Director of the School of Architecture at Dal. His uh, teaching and research investigates innovative building processes which encompass materials research, rethinking technology, and social aspects of architectural technology. As a trainer of the next generation of architects, James values partnership with engineering, arts, and social science disciplines, as well as industry and community groups to explore new design processes. So, and my understanding is you're gonna talk a bit about materials in your presentation too, which is a really interesting topic. You know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about energy, reducing energy, reducing GHG emissions, and then, then there's this whole embodied carbon piece, which is so, overwhelming as well, so you're going to help us crack that nut would be great. Happy to. Um, I'll just give myself a little bit of time. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, that's me. Um, and that works. Okay. So uh, thank you, everyone, and thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to um, talk today. I don't want to break this. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm just going to do this then. Um, so I'm calling this towards a net negative building economy in, in Nova Scotia. Um, and just thinking about how we typically think about uh, uh, greenhouse gas impacts. So it's from the government of Canada. Uh, you can see that buildings are kind of considered as a small uh, or smaller portion of, of impacts. But um, this is uh, a source from the International, I think it's called International Energy Association. And they've actually pulled out uh, the impacts of buildings. So actually looking at 38%. Um, and as was just mentioned, uh, that can be divided into operating carbon and, and embodied carbon, and I'll be talking mostly uh, about that piece there. Uh, so to, for anyone who's not familiar with uh, those terminologies, so operating carbon is the, the impacts of a, a building once it's in operation. Uh, embodied carbon is all the, the uh, carbon released to uh, make the building, uh, the materials that go into it. Um, so that uh, number can be positive, so by making a material you can throw more CO2 into the air, or if you use uh, in a large part bio-based materials, you can pull carbon out of, out of the air um, and so start to mitigate and, and even uh, offset uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The importance of this is operational carbon. We're getting very good at pulling that down. Net zero is a, is a thing, uh, and, and it's being widely in, implemented, not, not wide enough. Um, but the issue with, with embodied carbon is all buildings, all new buildings will have it. Uh, and then like an investment, like a financial investment, what we put in the, in the atmosphere now has, has longer term and, and exponential effects. So it's actually quite uh, a significant area. Um, my Recent research has started to look at uh, bio-based materials, and, and also the point I want to make in this too is that these uh, materials are drawing from uh, industries such as farming, fueling, other kind of uh, environmentally intensive industries. So <clears throat> at the, by the same time that they're mitigating climate impacts in those industries, it's also disrupting um, uh, impact chains uh, it, from the built environment, reducing extraction practices. Uh, and the other kind of note there is that th these are value-added uses of, of these inputs, uh, and they're usually low-grade inputs that, that don't actually have a, a monetary value. Uh, I've black-boxed uh, <laughs> the, the processes there. Uh, I'll be happy to unpack that if, if anyone would, would like. But you can see the different sectors that we're, we're, we're kind of looking at here. Um, and, and also, I just want to note uh, Laura Nolte in the, in the corner there, uh, uh, former research assistant and now working with, with uh, Habit Studio, and uh, is, has been a, a really uh, uh, sort of influence on, on this work. So thank you, Laura. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of these um, materials here that we've been looking at recently. Um, <clears throat> and that's a, a one, one wing of, of the work that we do. And these are what we call composite materials. And composite materials combine multiple uh, types of feedstocks to, to get uh, different types of utilization out of them. Um, so one of the first materials we looked at was a, what we call a biochar concrete. Um, and so that's a mixture of sand, uh, biochar, aggregate, and uh, uh, cement. Uh, and so it, it, gave, it gives the material unique uh, mechanical and, and, and thermal properties. And largely our interest was, you know, first of all, just testing it out, but also uh, demonstrating it, uh, making a, 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 a installation that we can kind of see how it performs over time. Uh, Lohr also uh, did a kind of carbon budget for it. Now, uh, of note is the biochar we are using is imported, so this is not an accurate carbon budget of the actual installation, but the, the biochar concrete that we developed, uh, which has low strength but, but is serviceable, uh, is not non-structural, uh, is actually one-sixth of, of a kind of typical concrete mix. So that, that's significant. And using it in a hybrid mode like we did for that column, we didn't, you know, we have concrete in that column because we, we don't want to uh, uh, collapse over time, uh, is actually reducing uh, by 18% the what normally would have been the concrete content. Now, a lot of times when we talk about these bio-based materials, uh, if you're like me, when you first heard about them, you thought of hay bale construction out in the countryside that wasn't really uh, uh, something that was going to be happening in our cities. Uh, there's a book that I, I cited there earlier called The New Carbon Architecture. I highly recommend it for anyone's interested in this. Uh, and they're talking about these materials at scale, uh, and that, that's, that's significant. So, uh, and this is just an installation that someone's developing with the biochar. Uh, for anyone not familiar with it, uh, it's using uh, uh, <clears throat> bio, biomass, any carbon-based biomass, and through a thermal chemical process, uh, stabilizing it as a, as a solid. 
Um, another uh, sort of kind of second case study is a material called, uh, called Flaxcrete, uh, developed by a, a, a civil engineering partner at Dow, Pedram Sedagian. Uh, and the value of, of Flaxcrete is that it's um, based on, on hemp-based products. And so these are, are products that are in the market, insulation, uh, uh, board panels. Uh, and, but unique to Nova Scotia, we have a flax, uh, uh, or a flax biome, say, um, and a kind of former industry uh, with it. And so um, it's also a low, low water uh, uh, use. Um, and uh, is a kind of is a byproduct. You're not growing the flax just for the, the, the product, but it's actually a byproduct of processing the flax for linen. A third um, uh, material that we're looking at are what we call living building materials. Uh, these are actually materials that can uh, reproduce. Uh, they're also materials that their biological processes can be, can be utilized. In this case, uh, we're sequestering uh, phytoplankton uh, in the block. The phytoplankton uh, calcifies and acts as a strengthening agent. Again, this is a process that's uh, being commercially developed in other, in other parts of uh, uh, the world. Um, and that's also feeding on uh, products from aquaculture, dairy, and, and agriculture. Right? So uh, uh, getting that kind of circular economy. We're also investigating the use of, of additive manufacturing with these materials. Uh, that lets us further uh, work from their, their intrinsic properties, develop higher efficiencies with use of their use, uh, and use computational processes to uh, uh, influence that. Um, it's always good, I think, to just have some numbers, so I'll just kind of wrap up uh, with some, some basic kind of uh, study, uh, quantitative data that we've collected, uh, also to demonstrate that there are other sectors in, in the or other areas of the globe studying these, these products. So the, the biochar concrete actually, in, in small quantities, has had uh, a strength enhancement of, of concrete mixes. Um, we've also studied the thermal properties, so it's actually uh, redu it's reducing the weight, but also uh, reducing the conductivity of the material. Um, the flaxcrete we've looked at in simulations, uh, looking at the R value, the embodied carbon. You can see. Uh, a, a Kind of large reduction there, and also uh, with help from a colleague, Austin Parsons, looking at uh, the operational uh, uh, impact of that over over time. Uh, and then with the uh, the living building material or the bio brick, uh, we're getting a 40% uh, strength enhancement with with that um, calcification biocalcification process. So just to wrap up. Um, you know, if we can think about materials on a continuum, uh, you know, we have uh, basic materials and small shifts that we can make with those materials. Uh, and so, you know, our existing material feedstock, you know, ha has kind of carbon positive, some carbon negative potentials. Um, but if we think about that, that kind of material chain over time and thinking about a, a roadmap for ourselves uh, in, in the province for how, how we can uh, start developing a, a net negative uh, uh, building economy. Uh, we can think about early stage, uh, 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 you know, ready to market uh, materials and processes, and ones that might be further further downfield, and start to map a trend as to how we can maybe by 2030 get to a, a, a kind of net zero uh, aspirations, and, and even start to, uh, as some people would say, cool the planet with our, uh, our building processes. Um, so special thanks to uh, research associates and assistants over time. Uh, as a faculty member, I have the privilege of working with uh, students who uh, uh, basically are the future for what we're doing and, and turn my mind around uh, continually. And then also just to recognize uh, the supports of collaborators and, and funders who have helped make this possible. Thank you. And, uh, oh. Thanks, James. And I think we're going to hold the questions and just go through the presentations and then have the dialogue after. So um, our next presenter is Lori Rand. Um, Lori is a certified passive house designer and has a Bachelor of Environmental Design Studies from Dalhousie uh, School of Architecture. She's co-founder of Habit Studio, which is a, ha a Halifax design practice focused on sustainable houses that nurture the senses. I like that. She serves on the National Board of Directors of Passive Buildings Canada and is the founder of The Pacifists, a group of designers and builders focused on increasing the number of passive house projects in Nova Scotia. Lori is also the co-founder of The Recover Initiative, a not-for-profit not dedicated to scaling retrofit solutions in Canada. And I assume you're going to talk about your yeah. Habit Studio house and your passive house. Uh, I am. And your uh, ret and uh, Recover as well. Yeah. 
Great, thanks, Laura. Uh, so Habit Studio, I'm going to talk about Habit Studio first, um, and uh, this is a picture of our team minus Lore, who's already waved to you once. Uh, Lore's our newest member. <laughs> uh, we're eight women, and uh, we, we do focus on uh, residential single-family projects mostly. However, my business partner, Judy, who's in the foreground, uh, she's going to be a licensed architect in about a week. So we're in a position of transformation at Habit Studio um, and probably will take on, we, we love houses, so we'll still be doing a lot of houses, but we may be taking on bigger projects too. So Habit Studio started very organically. Judy and I were architecture school classmates and worked together really informally on single family homes for many, many years before we officially became a company. And as we were um, uh, starting Habit Studio and de deciding what our, what our values and policies were gonna be, we made the decision that we were only going to do passive house new builds. Um, we'll, we'll still continue, do, we would still continue doing um, renovations that weren't passive, but we had done a couple of passive houses um, that at that point, and one of them was wildly more expensive than a code compliant house, and one of them was the same cost as everything else we did that year. And so we knew that they, were, they could be done affordably, and so that was where we decided to focus our efforts with new builds. And that one on the screen is our most recently completed one. It is definitely not affordable. It's just brand new, so that's why I'm showing it to you. <laughs> Um, and as we kind of leveled up our, our expertise with new build passive, we, we used that inf to inform our retrofits as well. And so we got closer and closer to net zero with retrofits as well. Um, uh, but, but we, until relatively recently, haven't done a passive, re a passive house retrofit. And so this is a building that we bought last fall and we're actively uh, renovating right now to the Passive House standard. Uh, and this building is an 1850s house. We actually found it on this hand-drawn map <laughs> um, uh, in the North End. And it very much looked quite a bit like it did in the 1850s when we took possession. Um, and so it had original windows, uh, single glazed. It had five fireplaces, uh, and it had a you know virtually no insulation. A little bit stuffed in random places, but definitely very little. And uh, it had a very 1850s blower door test result: uh, 24 air changes per hour. <laughs> So we're very excited about this project. It's going to be our future home. Uh, so another, uh, another chapter in the story of our transformation right now at Habit Studio. Um, and we're only going to do this once. Uh, and so as part of the project, we're actually um, we're sharing details about it as, you know, as widely as anybody will listen. Uh, we're doing a YouTube series about the construction. Uh, I think we've filmed three episodes so far. Um, and when it's all done, I will talk your ear about, off about it anytime anyone in this room wants to talk about it. And that's kind of, uh, that, that graph is the, the story of the incremental measures that we're going to be implementing to achieve the passive house, uh, and it's called Enerfit, the passive house retrofit targets. Um, those targets are a little bit relaxed from the standard um, classic new build passive house, but they're still very, very uh, hard to hit. Um, and you know, on paper, we can do it. We'll see what we can actually achieve in the field, and I'll let you know. So not every building is going to be retrofitted the way that we're doing our Falkland project. Um, we don't have the resources. We don't have the people, and we don't have the money, and we definitely don't have the time. And uh, because of that, and because I've got nearly 20 years of painful <laughs> single-family custom retrofit experience, 
uh, in, uh, at some point in 2019, I started another company almost by accident, 100% by accident, if I'm being honest. Um, so Recover is, um, uh, is a kind of collective started by myself with uh, Nick Rudnitsky and Emma Norton. Um, and we, we wanted to develop deep retrofit solutions that can be implemented at scale uh, and at the speed that's needed to address climate change. And we're literally copying the Dutch. Um, we are working to adapt the energy sprung model to the North American climate. And we're doing this because this is the only retrofit initiative um, that, that has ever succeeded in, in scaling and in over time becoming less, uh, less expensive. And so essentially it's what you see on screen, it's automating retrofits. So buildings are scanned with LiDAR and uh, a prefabricated envelope is made in a factory and then brought to site and fastened to the building. And the benefits of this, aside from sort of off-site construction, which is, um, you know, a, a lot more rigorous in terms of quality control, um, the primary benefits are speed. So a matter of weeks instead of months for, um, the, you know, comparable results um, in, in conventional construction. And also, in this method, people can stay in the buildings. And so when we have a housing crisis with run evictions being in the news, all the time. Um, we really can't retrofit buildings the way that we need to um, and keep people in their homes. So this allows us to do retrofits faster using fewer people and uh, no displacement. So just as the pandemic was starting, we started to study this building and we picked it partly because it's a kind of ubiquitous apartment building. Um, in Halifax, partly literally just because the owners were like, yeah, we're game, you can study our building. <laughs> um, and so, you know, our initial focus was thinking about apartment buildings, these kind of 1960s, 70s, 80s, shoebox looking buildings that are everywhere. Um, they're going to be relatively easy to panelize a, a renovation and, um, and frequently they're in need of renewal and they, uh, the energy performance is, you know, needs to be improved. And so those are the results on the screen. I'm not going to read them out, but I am going to tell you that because we finished this in July of 2020, um, and literally everyone in Canada was in lockdown, um, when we had a webinar about this, uh, you know, this, this sort of um, motley crew from Halifax, very tiny team, over 100 people from across the country attended our webinar. Um, and you know it's it's timely information. Everybody is uh, everybody knows that we need to solve retrofits, but we were sort of um, shocked at the attention that we got at the time. And that propelled us to working with Toronto Community Housing. Um, uh, literally, just that was our next step. And you know, they're the largest affordable housing provider in the country, second largest in North America. And they they asked us to study uh, energy sprung solutions for their townhouse portfolio. And so that's the building we started with. It's a six-unit uh, 1960s energy pig, badly in need of renewal and quite representative of their portfolio. And we found that through a panelized retrofit, uh, we could achieve 88% energy savings and 97% GHG uh, reductions. And on both slides, I noted the carbon storage because we are we're promoting uh, cellulose-filled panels as our solution. Um, so it's great to be following James so that I don't have to explain embodied carbon. Uh, you know, with the very short time in which we need to be retrofitting virtually all of our buildings, we really uh, can't be using materials that emit a lot of carbon in the short term to save energy in the long term. 
Uh, and so, uh, in this building, it actually, you might have noted that we've got less carbon storage in this bigger building. It's partly because it needed less insulation to meet the targets, and partly because we changed our calculation uh, te technique between the two studies. Uh, and in this case, we've achieved, if they proceed with the retrofit, which the budget hasn't been found yet, um, they'll get uh, about three and a half million dollars of lifetime operational savings by doing this. So we always study the total cost of building ownership as well as the uh, energy performance changes. And I'm very excited to be able to talk about this now. So we've been working on this project for about a year and a half, but we're only allowed to talk about it this month. Um, so um, we received a grant from Anarchan to study six buildings in uh, six municipalities in Canada, three of them here in Nova Scotia. Um, again, same kind of study looking at a panelized retrofit. And there's our little Halifax building. So <laughs> this is, um, we're right in the midst of our study right now. So I've got no results to show you. Um, but, uh, you know, again, looking at energy performance, uh, how to get to net zero with these buildings and how to do it in a way that minimizes embodied carbon. And finally, this is my last slide, Sarah. <laughs> um, we're really excited to, uh, to kind of level up our research at Habit Studio, um, looking at not only um, storing carbon in the building, but carbon in the building, but looking at regenerative insulation through this uh, study of mycelium, um, which is uh, sponsored by Halifax. So um, we were selected to take part in the Halifax Climate Challenge. Um, we're going to be growing some mycelium insulation in, uh, in, in small panels to, uh, to understand if they actually, if this is actually a means of, um, of retrofitting buildings at a large scale using a regenerative insulation. And one of the reasons for this is because when we're promoting um, a cellulose-based solution, um, it's actually problematic because cellulose is essentially recycled newspaper. Nobody actually reads real newspaper anymore. So the recycling, uh, the, the manufacturers of cellulose are encountering supply chain issues with getting the newsprint. And they're actually, um, the quality is going down now because they're using Amazon boxes and things like that. There's like little bits of plastic tape in the cellulose at times. And, um, you know, going forward as Recover, we're, and as Habit Studio as well, we, we aren't promoting solutions that use any other kind of insulation if we can avoid it. Um, we're gonna, we're going to hit a, hit a snag there if we keep promoting cellulose. So um, that's what we're doing. And I have about a million more things I could tell you, but my time's up. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Um, and I encourage everybody to, uh, you've got notebooks there, start noting your questions. I'm sure you've got lots as, as, we're, uh, as we're progressing here. Uh, Natalie Leonard is our next speaker. She is the first certified passive house consultant and certified passive house builder in Canada. Her mission is to make sustainable, high performance homes affordable for everyone. She leads the passive design solutions team with a depth of experience in creating cost-effective, beautiful, and ultra-efficient homes. Natalie brings her engineering background, hands-on design and construction experience, and a practical approach to building. And lots of exciting projects. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, and uh, really, I just want to give kudos here to Lori for her work on retrofits. Um, we've done a few retrofits early in our work and it's very difficult. Uh, so we chose to stick with new construction um, to, for, for our business because it's just a whole lot easier. So uh, kudos to Lori for her hard work. Uh, passive Design Solutions is also a Halifax-based team. Um, we've been working in Passive House and Net Zero Design since 2009, um, exclusively in those projects. We do custom design work, multifamily and single family. Um, we developed a series of stock plans, so they're ready-made designs with a specific orientation that are Passive House uh, energy modeled and um, climate um, tested. 
We also do a lot of training. So because we started off as a design build team, um, we have good experience in how things have to change in the methods of construction. So we do a lot of hands-on training and I'm a trainer for the Passive House Institute US um, for their builders. So we um, have gathered some momentum, especially with the stock plans and we're currently working on about 100 Passive House projects a year. So we're starting to, to see, a li although that's still tiny in the big scheme of things, um, moving from the three or four or five we started doing yearly um, to, to achieving over 100 a year is a, is a big milestone for us. So today we're talking about net zero buildings and in our definition it's the building produces as much energy as it uses annually. So we are using the grid, uh, the, the utility Nova Scotia Power here in Nova Scotia to act as a 100% efficiency battery. And I'm sure everybody here is, knows this, but what we're doing is creating energy on the building with some type of renewable technology. We're, we're, we're uh, net metering it back into the grid. And then uh, in the summer, we're typically producing more because uh, photovoltaic panels are the most commonly used technology. Uh, and then in the wintertime when we need more energy, we're using that. So we are um, using Nova Scotia Power as our efficient battery. But that creates a bit of a big, a big pro a problem in the big scheme. So this is what they call the, the duck curve. This is the, uh, let's see if I can make this. Oh, look at this. So then the times a day, we can see this is the, the overall power use on a grid. It's not our grid, but it just gives you the example, okay? And then over time, you can see as more solar has been implemented, and because the solar is used up on site first before it's fed into the grid, our, our uh, drop during these lower utilization times has been more significant. And then when everybody gets home for dinner and starts turning all the lights on and the TV and starts cooking, we ramp up to this really high power need, okay? And th this ramp up is a big problem for the utilities. So we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about um, where we're going because th those peak loads in Nova Scotia are, are met by coal fire power plants. And these are things we want to eliminate, um, but until we get rid of the peak loads, we can't shut down those power plants that operate strictly to, to meet those peak loads. And they're expensive to operate um, when they don't need to be utilized all the time. There's another issue with net zero in site building. I get a kick out of this little cartoony sketch. But um, if we try to just put Solar, solar panels on the roof of our code-built buildings, there's just not enough roof space. So the first thing we need to do is conserve energy um, before we start adding, uh, adding panels to the roofs. And then nobody in this room needs a reminder of our, um, the impacts of storms and the survivability in climate change. We just had Fiona. Um, the storms are increasing in intensity and frequency. And um, we're also seeing with the, with the trouble with the war in Ukraine that we're seeing really volatile energy costs, which has a uh, energy security problem for, for um, folks that are trying to live on a, on a small budget. Then we've got our storms, and my parents were without power for 11 days in Fiona, in Cape Breton. Um, and this can, depending on the time of the year, can lead to problems with the um, occupant's safety, with freezing temperatures, and also building damage if we have frozen pipes, okay? So the, the message, the solution to those three particular problems, I'm talking about the peak loads on the grid, the size of the roof and how much solar we can fit on it, and survivability in storms is to first conserve energy before we start adding renewable systems to the designs. And this is why we work with the passive house approach um, by reducing overall site energy by about 60% plus in over code built. So you may have noticed in Lori's slides the, the savings over, over the existing case was higher than that. And that's because our building code is not really terrible um, in Nova Scotia. The buildings that are being retrofit are starting at a much lower point than our typical code. So, but it, and you can see here that that this is where our code now is. So over time, you can see we've reduced the overall energy. The yellow is heat. 
and the, the use of a passive house is down here. Okay, so we can re really drastically reduce the energy consumption of the building. Uh, and really what that's doing um, for, uh, that's smoothing out that peak load on the grid, right? So if we can reduce the energy use by 60% in our buildings, we're also drastic re drastically reducing the overall peak load on the grid, which will have a big impact on how we build our utilities. So Lori talked about Passive House, and probably many of you know, I see lots of faces in the room that know lots about Passive House, but, but let's just quickly run through it. So it's recognized as the world's leading energy efficient standard. Um, it can be used on any building type. So it can be single family, commercial, multifamily. Bigger buildings are actually easier to achieve Passive House than smaller buildings, just because of the volume to surface area ratio. It just uses some really simple principles. So we, we orient to the sun and make sure that we're designed to take as much free heat from, from the sun as we can without causing overheating in summer months. <clears throat> we're simply super insulating the building, wrapping um, you know two to three times more insulation than code around the assemblies and eliminating thermal bridges. And then thermal bridges are where two materials come together of a different R value, and they can be a real heat flux across the building. So when we start to super insulate, we must also eliminate thermal bridging. We are very airtight. Typical new construction is an ACH of three. Passive house target is 0 0.06, so about five times tighter than the average new construction building. We're using high performance windows and doors, lots of the air leakage, as well as the thermal losses and solar gains um, are through the, the, through the glazing. So we wanna have really good windows and doors. And then once we've done all that with the building envelope, then we have these tiny loads. We can implement very efficient mechanical and electrical systems to meet the small loads that, that are required. And the, the idea here is that the passive house um, can start to use the house as a bit of a thermal boundary. So you could use time, to, we have the first uh, project that we built in Halifax, first certified house in Canada, we, um, we had a, an, e, an ETS electric thermal storage unit in the, in the living room and um, electric baseboards in the rest of the rooms and we had monitoring equipment on the electrical use of that project for for uh, a good uh, couple years and it was interesting. We could see that the electric thermal storage was actually not working as it was intended and it was coming on during peak times because it it's kinda doesn't have many brains, it's a bit stupid in how it functions. So we uh, just turned it off and we heated the house with the electric baseboards in the other rooms without any heat in the great room and uh, the heat would only be on for about two or three hours overnight and the rest of the time the house was running without heat um, during the rest of the day. So we can use a passive house as a part of that thermal battery and again help reduce that, that peak load on the grid, which is really our long-term goal here in, in greening up the grid. So how does it work? So basically, sorry, in a code-built building, these are, this is where, this is just looking at heat. We are in a heated dominated climate. So this is where all the transmission losses are going. Okay, so uh, heat flowing out through the building envelope, doors and windows, air leakage, and ventilation. So we have to make that up on the other balance. Some comes from the sun, some comes from internal heat gains. Every one of us is a 100 watt heater. So we contribute to the heat. But then the rest of that heat must be made up with a mechanical heating system. In a passive house, you can see we start to reduce those losses in every category by a fairly drastic amount. Our internal gains came the same. In this model, we kept the same design, although this is not always the case. You don't get this much free sun in a code-built design. So we can reduce the heating system by usually about 90% over uh, the code-built building. In this slide, I've had to kind of shrink these numbers down to give the same scale, but this is where the energy goes in the code-built building. This is just a particular energy model we did. Um, it's for a multifamily building in Dartmouth. So you can see all the categories of where energy gets used. And in our climate, heating is the single largest energy user. Hot water is next, and appliances 
with high density of uh, multifamily is the next largest item. So using the energy model, all passive houses should have an energy model. That's how you figure out this balance between renewables and conservation. You can see we've drastically reduced, reduced heating, hot water, appliances improve a tiny bit, but not much. There's only a certain amount you can do with appliances. And then, then we add solar to the roof um, in order to get to net zero. And we're just squeaking by in roof space on this multifamily building to fit, fit the, the uh, number of panels that are needed. And the simplicity of Passive House was what, uh, what really attracted me to it. Initially, I went to a conference and met the Passive House folks from, from the US. And it just made so much sense that I went back to my hotel room in Boston and booked myself to go to Chicago the next weekend to start the training. And it, uh, it, it basically, we're, we're really doing some extreme things to the building envelope so that we can reduce the heat loads to the point where we don't need a conventional heating system. If you take a 2,000 square foot house on the coldest night of the year in Halifax, you could heat it with the equivalent heat of two hair dryers. That's the level we're taking these buildings. Okay? Most people don't believe you when you say that, but, but it is true. Or cook some cookies and have some friends over. So uh, you, will hear, you will hear that uh, you don't need a heating system in a passive house. That is true in Germany where they don't have cold temperatures during the winter. They can add enough auxiliary heat through the ventilation air. In our climates, except around Vancouver Island and Victoria, um, we, uh, and I'm running out of time here, so I'll skip ahead, but we do need heaters in our passive houses. They are simple heating systems. And uh, the money that we save on the heating system helps pay for the upgrades of the rest of the building envelope. I have this highlighted because costs are really a moving target right now and we're not confident in saying it's five to 10% more on the budget, but um, for many years this is where we operate it. And it is more cost effective to save energy first before you start ordering, ordering um, adding uh, systems. So I won't read these through, um, but basically we're gonna reduce transmission losses through, through the building envelope and prevent overheating. Then we're gonna reduce the appliances and the plug loads. Then we're gonna educate the homeowner because occupant behavior has a huge in, impact on total energy use. And then we can add renewables to meet the site energy. I will say that I think there's an argument in this, in this conversation around net zero that site net zero may not be the best solution. I think that drastically reducing the energy demands of a building and greening up the grid is probably a more efficient way to achieve net zero. We don't necessarily have the roof space, the cost of maintenance, um, the embodied energy in solar panels can be a factor that, that may in the big equation of embodied carbon not be the, the correct answer for us. Um, and I have a few other slides, but I think I'll end there and, uh, and just skip through these um, to get to the end. Oh, I will point out this, this is a net zero project that we're really proud of. It's the Add, add Some Sunflower House, 25 units for women and children at risk. It's full net zero because the organization does not have the money to pay the operational costs to operate the building where they can raise money to, for the capital costs of building it. And I'm glad that uh, James already talked about uh, embodied carbon because I don't have time to. And thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, Rob is next. Uh, Rob's with Clean Foundation. He's an energy advisor and uh, quality assurance specialist within uh, Enercan's Energuide rating system for existing buildings and multi-use properties. He's a certified energy manager through the Association of Energy Engineers and a public historian with over 15 years experience working in Nova Scotia's not-for-profit sector. In his position as Director of Energy of Clean Foundation, Rob creates and delivers energy retrofit initiatives with a focus on underserved and underrepresented communities. Awesome. Welcome to Halifax from Sydney. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Um, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot today about um, innovative building practices, embodied carbon materials that we use. Um, 
I think the other folks on this panel have done a great job of pointing us in the direction of like where the future of our built environment will go in Nova Scotia. Um, to get there, I'd like to just highlight that, you know, where we're at right now, the foundation of existing programs and services that exist in the province. Uh, make a couple of observations around existing homes because it's such a huge part of the homes that will exist again for us in 2050. And just a couple suggestions on how we might adapt our approach to existing home retrofits in Nova Scotia. Um, so first, for those of you that may not be fully familiar with CLEAN, we are the largest um, environmental charity in Atlantic Canada. We have uh, right around 100 employees uh, who focus on a bunch of different programmatic areas of, uh, of focus on climate change. We focus on education and engagement from our youngest citizens to our community elders. Uh, we're developing the workforce for the clean economy, both here in Nova Scotia, but across all of Canada. Uh, we have uh, folks that focus on policy and innovation, kind of helping to shape the regulatory framework of, uh, of, of, of how we approach climate change in our province, a lot of public consultation. Uh, we have teams that are looking at EV charging, uh, uh, infrastructure across our province, proliferating EVs, uh, but also active transportation, removing cars from the road as well. Uh, we have a Clean Coast team. Uh, we call them Clean Coast, but they focus on the natural environment. We've already mentioned the importance of not just retrofitting buildings, but looking at the resiliency uh, factor. So looking at salt marshes, how we adapt our, our um, natural environment to help mitigate changes um, that are coming. And my department, um, as mentioned, is uh, focused on energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, I will also just highlight, I have social equity on the board. That's not a, a department. That is something that we embed in all the work that we do at CLEAN. So we take our charitable mandate really seriously at CLEAN. It finds us working with underserved and underrepresented populations in all the work we do uh, all across the province. Um, so as far as the built environment, why I was invited here today, I've been trying to figure it out. Um, so I, I do a lot of work. I have a team of about 30 people across the province who look at predominantly ex existing homes and the energy efficiency question. Uh, how do we renovate this built environment across our province? Um, that includes electrification pathways for buildings, but also on-site renewable energy. Um, increasingly, it also includes, um, as was just mentioned, options for net metering where we don't have enough roof space um, or access to uh, you know, affordable forms of on-site renewable. How can we reduce the cost of renewable infrastructure? Um, I have EV charging and policy again on this slide because we're not just looking at how to plug holes in the current system uh, in, in, in how we retrofit buildings, but having a line of sight on what the expectation will be for existing homes in 20, 30 years. Uh, so we, we really do focus a lot on how do we fix the infrastructure within our buildings so that we can, um, in 10 years from now, when we have 30% you know, electric vehicles by 2030, um, how are we preparing low-income households to have the infrastructure for EV charging on-site at home? How can we not uh, create a problem where folks can't participate in solar, on-site solar, in the next generation of, of energy efficiency retrofits? So a lot of that work involves educating homeowners, educating community leaders, involving the people, not just making plans for the homes, but the people that live in them. If they're included in the planning, if they're helping us to build those ideas, there's more buy-in, there's more reality that we will get to where we need to be. And creating the plan is one half of the coin. Um, the other half is having enough people to, to fulfill that plan. So that's the, the focus on developing the retrofit workforce. So we've, we've established programs at Clean where we'll inject a few hundred people uh, into the clean trades as energy efficiency professionals specifically from underrepresented and, uh, and underserved communities over the next few years. We're, we're super proud of that work. So just a few observations first on the existing home market. We have a lot of old homes, you know? The, the housing market in Nova Scotia is extremely old. A century old building has likely had renovations once every 10 years for that 100 years. Um, the, the second point here, permits and renovation code. We don't have a net zero retrofit code to, to guide us. We certainly don't have the enforcement uh, at, a, at a local municipal level to make sure that all the renovations that we're doing adhere by best practice. So, you know, when we go in to do energy audits, it is a fact-finding mission. We could have 10 different construction types within the same building, trying to understand how that home is constructed, how best to approach a retrofit, especially a deep energy retrofit, is incredibly difficult. 
my sister is an architect in Manhattan where you can't hang a curtain rod without an architect. <laughs> you know? um, here in Nova Scotia, I've seen full two-story additions go on the back of homes without, uh, without any planning professionals, engineers, architects involved. Um, so we, we've got some work on the regulatory side, and uh, it's just worth mentioning, you know, 80% of those homes that exist across our province right now will still exist in 2050. They, they need to be renovated. It's not optional if we want to meet our targets. Um, the other kind of big side of the need for us, um, you know, 20% of our, our overall GHG emissions come from the built environment and homes. Uh, the majority of that within the built environment comes from heating. So uh, with those 200,000 plus homes heating with home heating oil, um, oil is kind of the, the hot button topic right now. Uh, super volatile pricing, uh, home heating oil appliances are on one hand incredibly durable, at this, on the same hand they're inc incredibly inefficient. So, you know, we have uh, expensive and unpredictable heating costs, for, uh, predominantly for low-income Nova Scotians across the province, and it's being bolstered by existing systems. So we've got businesses that service home heating oil machines and still install them, uh, we even have provincial programs that still swap equipment for like equipment. So every time that we install uh, an oil boiler to replace an oil boiler, we are putting a system in place that will last for 20, 30 years. We're at 2050 at that point. We don't have the option to do that anymore. <laughs> you know, so we have to stop installing new equipment because the reality is it's like locking low-income Nova Scotians not only into a dependence on fossil fuels for the next generation, but also into a relationship with energy poverty, because the, the cost of that, that heating service is just going to increase. Um, the good thing about oil right now is that it's creating a financial incentive for us to make change. And now there's a business case more and more for us to electrify homes and get away from fossil fuel dependency. Um, on the flip side of the financial question, we've got wood. And in my neck of the woods in Cape Breton, we still have some folks heating with coal directly in their homes. The, it's a, an extremely low cost source of heat, you know, especially for those, there are a lot of folks in rural Nova Scotia that own their own woodlot. It's free heat, you know. Um, so the cost of electrification, if you're in one of these homes, you may be asking somebody to pay thirty, forty thousand $40,000 to go through a process of electrifying their home. The reward they get for that is an extra three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 in annual heating costs. So now you're looking at another you know, $30,000 for on-site solar. Um, you know, it's a really difficult argument to make. It's super common across all rural, rural Nova Scotia. It's a huge problem in some of our financing programs. Even in homes where we are already heating with electric, um, the most common form of electric heat that we have in Nova Scotia is still just electric baseboard rads. Um, so if you want to take advantage of high efficiency heat pumps, if you want the comfort of cooling, which is increasingly a human right in this province, um, you're still looking at large enabling upgrades uh, to your electrical infrastructure, to the service coming into the home, just to accommodate that heat pump technology. So in all cases, you know, the enabling upgrades, the investments we have to make in decommissioning oil systems, upgrading electrical panels, there's a huge investment required if we want to move in the right direction. So the approach we take to that need here in Nova Scotia is pretty programmatic, I would say. Um, I'm not going to list all these programs or explain what they are, but there's a ton, you know? We, we have a habit of creating specific programs with eligibility requirements, intake, um, and then, uh, you know, just continually adding to the pile of different programs. We have a bunch of different streams. Um, so I, I will just point to one common theme in that programmatic approach. So quick graph, um, it's, it's uh, so the color, they're color coordinated between the two sides. So at the very top of the graph, you'll see uh, budget per home in a program. I've just taken five representative programs. Um, that represents a Housing Nova Scotia project that's currently investing about $35,000 per host to do what's the closest example of deep energy retrofits at scale in our province. Um, that's full electrification, building envelope upgrades. We're certainly finding that even 35 grand doesn't go far enough in a lot of what are relatively small public housing units. At the bottom end of that budget graph, you see residential direct install programs. This is considered like the low-hanging fruit, swapping light bulbs, wrapping hot water tanks, putting in uh, smart thermostats. Really low-level investment, a few hundred bucks per house. What you'll see on the bottom side is the number of homes that are engaged in each of those types of programs. 
So our deep energy retrofit programs, the ones that are going the full route of electrification, we've got about 60 homes a year going through that deep energy retrofit process through Housing Nova Scotia. We've got about 10,000 homes a year going through some of those residential direct install programs. So I guess the, the point I'm trying to make there is that the initiatives that we have existing in our programs in, uh, in Nova Scotia, what we have are the ones that are going far enough, broad enough, they're not going deep enough. The ones that are going deep enough are not serving a big enough audience. You know, so there's a huge need for increased investment in financing, creating those financial investment um, arguments to help people invest in their own properties, but also investments from all levels of government uh, and the private sector. Um, as has well already been mentioned, we need to understand embodied carbon better. If we're getting into deep energy retrofits, we find a way to insulate every basement in the province. Do we do it with rock wool? Do we do it with spray foam? Is there a new technology that we should be implementing? Um, and then, of course, the social gaps in our programming as well. So I came from a meeting earlier this week in North Preston. Um, African Nova Scotians in the Preston Townships still have a systemic issue accessing land deeds to their homes that prevents them to take part in programs like home warming, where you have to prove home ownership. Um, and that's just one example. You know, if we get into a shared solar program where you have to prove ownership in the same way, we'll just be replicating that problem. Uh, renters across our province, huge demographic that has very little agency in the homes that they live in, even less agency in how that home is renovated or, or the energy performance. Uh, so we have to find ways of bridging that gap and including everybody in the, in the transition. Um, those programs that I highlighted were addressing about 10,000 homes a year. 200,000 homes heating with oil, many more that are aging and in need of renewal. Uh, we just need to move faster and we have to go deeper in all the work that we do. So it's not all grim, you know, every week there's, um, there's new announcements about, um, you know, funding sources, new initiatives that are coming on board. You know, Canada Greener Homes Grant earlier this year only took me 15 months to get my rebate. Um, CMHC, uh, $40,000 zero interest loan, uh, federal heat pump grants that are, are going to be incorporated within existing programs. Um, the, the DSM that was approved earlier this year for Efficiency Nova Scotia, $173 million. Uh, Shannon Miedema and Halifax won an award for the best clean energy project across Canada this year for creating stable, continual investment in this type of work. Um, so there's, and, and I mentioned before our clean energy and equity initiatives here at Clean that are, are trying to ensure that as we kind of build this new economy around energy efficiency and renewable energy, we have an opportunity to do that in a way that eliminates some of those systemic barriers that were in previous models. So that's all for me. I, the only thing I'll, I'll add to that is, you know, that long list of programs, you know, there may be folks in this province, low-income folks across Nova Scotia who qualify for home warming. They qualify for home energy assessments and greener homes. They qualify for housing renewal programs through provincial programs and, and many more initiatives, heating assistance rebates. Um, we have to do better jobs of not just creating little programmatic intakes, like plugging little gaps and doing a piecemeal approach to energy efficiency. Uh, but regardless of your, your income eligibility, your program eligibility, your starting point, your understanding of the importance of this stuff, we just have to create relationships with people and provide them a service that takes them from wherever they're at to net zero. You know, it's about linking all of the existing programs and initiatives and funding, adding to it, and making sure that we can scale up this work in, in a hurry. You know, there's a real need. So, awesome. that's all. Thanks, Rob. Um, I think I have a few slides just to wrap things up. Um, to talk a little bit about some of the policy um, mechanisms that are in place to do all of this work. I, I think we thank you to all of the panelists for reiterating the problem we have in front of us, this huge, enormous problem, and how complex it is, um, and how much work we have to do. So um, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of collaboration happening, and I think that's really key to, to how we move forward. I also think that we're getting into an environment where um, 
voluntary measures are becoming not enough to, to move this forward. We need to see more aggressive building codes. Uh, we need to see procurement um, happen with the building owners that, are, that own big building stock, like the provincial government, like the city, um, show leadership. And we are seeing a lot of that, but we need more of that so that it really drives this market transformation that, that needs to happen and help us address these problems. So um, one of the projects that I'm working on is the concept for a Centre for Green Building Excellence, and many of you have been stakeholders in some of the roundtables that we've been having for it. So um, just to give a little bit of background, this is a, um, an initiative that's funded through HCI3, which is our Low Carbon Cities uh, initiative for Halifax, um, and the foundational partners are Dalhousie University and the Construction Association of Nova Scotia, and then um, me as a consultant had been doing the, the legwork on it. Um, but really it's it's to investigate the feasibility of an actual center for green building excellence and I, I don't mean that in terms of a physical center but it's a it's a collaborative initiative that brings industry together to to work through these problems and there's a bit of a, a hub um, for all of us to continue a, in this work and, and it's really just to to catalyze the, that adoption and the market transformation um, there um, and I don't need to reiterate the problem. <laughs> we know the problem. You know, our, our built environment contributes significantly, um, and we need to we need to address that. Um, Nova Scotia has legislated targets around buildings that are in the um, new climate legislation um, that are fairly aggressive, which is great. And so, and we're all waiting very eagerly for the provincial climate plan to come out yesterday and uh, it, it was we're, we're hearing December so yesterday was December 1st and where is it but uh, <laughs> uh, so we expect to see that there's going to be more detail in the um, in the provincial climate plan um, but some of the things again are around those procurement pieces that there's a lot of um, leverage that the provincial government has to demand uh, a change in how we address buildings so they will only lease space from buildings that are net zero buildings. They will only build to a net zero standard. And you can see how that elevates the, the industry um, and sends clear signals to what we all need to be, be doing. Um, Halifax, we know, has very aggressive targets around, um, around our built environment as well. And this isn't just for Halifax's own buildings. This is for every building in the city. So, um, you know, there, there's a big question on, on how we do that. You know, Halifax, as a, as a municipality, has a lot of control over their own buildings. But how do we encourage all of the other building owners, so commercial building owners, residential building owners, to get on board with this, given all of the complexity and challenges and costs associated with it. What kind of environment are we creating for that? So we're looking at other models um, across the country with these sort of zero emission building exchanges, and Vancouver's a good example, and Vancouver actually built their ZEBEX model um, based on New York City's um, model, and the idea is that there's a that this is an industry exchange and a way for us to uh, to work together. And they have specific initiatives under the ZEBEX model. Um, one of them is the B2E program that BC is running, which was building to electrification. So they know that they need to electrify buildings. How are we going to do that? How is industry going to work together to do that? And um, BC has the um, the happy um, situation of being having a much cleaner grid than we do, so their their path to net zero is significantly easier in some ways than Nova Scotia's is because we have this whole grid coal issue that we still have to um, that we have to change. So I also looked at um, models in Alberta and Manitoba, um, Waterloo, and then other models that we have in our own backyard, like Cove, which is a collaborative of industry to advance the um, ocean sector, and it's an ocean sector hub. So looking at building something like that that's going to serve the building industry. So we had a couple of roundtables, very well attended, um, 58 round members at the first one, and I think about 47 or 48, really talking about 
guiding principles and what a center could do, um, and, and really, can we show demonstration projects? Can we continue to highlight the work of Lori and Natalie and Keith and others that are working in this, in this industry? Um, how do we influence policy and code, but also to how do we help navigate? How do we help um, organizations and individuals figure out what they need to be doing? Um, so, I won't speak very much more about that, but basically it's, let's get this happening, let's solve the problems. And um, there are a number of, of organizations that are working in this space, so building a collaborative would be engaging with those other stakeholders in the space. It's certainly not to do the work that others are already doing, but how do you ampl amplify the work of others and how do you share information, how do you work together, how do you find opportunities to collaborate? Um, and learn from each other. So at the, right now we're at the point where we're uh, investigating host organization, um, who's, gonna, who's gonna sort of be the secretariat for this organization, um, who's on the advisory committee, how do we build that, and then we have to get funding, and <laughs> there's no funding for the project yet. So we're building the structure for it, and, um, but we know that there's funding out there, and um, particularly at the federal level, but also provincially and, and through the municipality, that, that working together, that coalition building is a really important piece of that. And then we'll have to staff it up and, and continue to, to bring people together. So we've got one more round table at the end of January. If you're not already participating and you'd like to, please let me know. Um, and then by the end of January, there'll be a report going forward for a potential Center for Green Building Excellence. And that's me. Hey, um, Sarah, I think you're going to have us do some funny stuff, right? Before we, uh, before we get to questions, do you, okay. Do, yeah, here I am. Um, so yeah, we, we are, there's so much richness here and I'm sure there's lots of questions, but we do want to just take a moment to, to talk to each other. So I want to encourage you not to turn and talk to the person that you came with, but to if, if there's somebody in front of you that you don't know or someone around you don't know, like feel free to kind of stand up and move around and find somebody. But I want you to talk to one other person and really just like what was, what was really striking to you? What did you hear that provoked something for you? And what are some of the questions that are coming up for you? And they don't have to be technical questions. They can be big fundamental questions. But we're just going to give you five minutes to chat with somebody, could be behind you, could be in front of you, could be next to you, or you might have to get up and go find somebody. And then we're gonna come back for questions. And then we're gonna come back for questions. Okay. So we're going to just invite the panelists to come back to the table. The thing I hate most is interrupting a good conversation, so I apologize. So, so Megan and I both have a microphone and we would love to hear either if you have a question or if you're having an interesting conversation, there's something from your conversation that you want to share. So you don't have to just ask questions, you can also tell us cool things, um, but we'd love to hear from you if you have something that you're willing to contribute. Hi, uh, stay at home dad here. I have a 13 year old and a six year old and I have found so few things to get them involved with the climate. Uh, we've done some shoreline cleanups around this pro city and around the province, and it's a great way to keep them engaged. But as this one's getting older, he's getting more uh, trouble focusing on the things he's done so many times before. So I'm wondering, is there any engagement opportunities for youth and teens? I would say that's a question for Rob, um, because Clean Foundation has a number of programs, including Green Schools, Nova Scotia, which is something you can get in your school if you're interested, but I'll let Rob. No, that was a great plug. Yeah. And just, can I just say, we are making a recording and a video, so 
for Rob and Laura, if you can just talk a little closer to the mic, the sound will be a lot better. Thank sure, you. Sure, yeah. So I think um, I, I may not be the best person at Clean to speak to our educational programs, but as Laura mentioned, we, we do have in-school programming, which kind of evolves into clean leadership positions, which help to give youth their first kind of uh, lily pad into the clean economy workforce. Uh, so if folks are interested, get engaged in the classroom, and then eventually have an opportunity to have their first meaningful employment in the clean sector, um, it's just a great way to kind of like grab that enthusiasm of youth and uh, of youth and translate it into like more passionate people that are in the room today. I'm, I'm looking at the team from Clean that's sitting directly behind you that will have more information. Does, so. does anybody over here want to add something? I mean, it's it's a very simple thing. Like the easiest way is to to look at our website and and check out like the education department on it. And there's there's all kinds of like uh, modules there that like um, uh, teachers around the province can can be a part of. The uh, the job uh, opportunities for for clean leaders that happen uh, every year for for summer placements. There's there's some there's a few for that are uh, high school students are eligible for. So you have to be a little bit older. Um, uh, those are uh, nine weeks long, um, you know, and, and we'll, we'll start to do the intake this winter around that. Uh, the majority of them are for, for returning university students, um, but, you know, it's something we're thinking about all the time. Uh, w one of the things that we don't do a lot of is uh, stuff that involves volunteers. Like uh, at the Clean Foundation, most of our work is, is like what we figure it's, it, it's, it's paid work. There are other organizations around that um, are uh, more volunteer focused and uh, you know, I think Halifax might be a good uh, you know, uh, place to, uh, I don't want to throw Shannon right in front of us, but um, you know, I think we're, we're, we're <laughs> putting a lot of things together uh, and you know, trying to develop ways to engage outside of the experts. Um, you know, I think we heard that very clearly from Louise uh, Ngongo last, last session. It's like we've heard a lot from the experts, now it's time to hear from, from, from everybody else. But uh, you bring up a good point and I'm, and I'm glad to hear it. And we, we are uh, at the Clean Foundation like consistently amazed and uh, made to feel so much better when we spend time with youth. And uh, I, I often find that their clarity around the, the, the issues that we're dealing with is much better than people my age. I'll send you some links. Can I just add? Yeah, thanks. Um, so for Halifax, we actually have the Adventure Earth Center, which is fantastic if you haven't heard about it. And there's actually opportunities for volunteering and for paid work for youth. Um, and they, they learn to lead and then they teach those that come after them to lead. And it's a really fantastic program. And they offer summer camps as well. Um, we've done little things like art contests for youth for celebrating the first year of our climate plan. Our reach is not big enough though and we're really just starting to focus on that. Also, Regional Council has a youth advisory committee um, where council is actually trying to like tap into youth uh, to understand their priorities to try and actually infuse that into their decisions of council. So there, there's a bunch of different layers of things. There's also on the volunteer side there's a lot and I'm not up to date on all of it but like the Young Naturalist Club is really active in Halifax um, and there's lots of other volunteer opportunities um, as well thanks Great. And, you know, I'll just sorry I'll just add that at the School of Architecture we've um, run youth workshops uh, those have typically been coordinated with the community organization but I think I'm really glad to hear uh, that need and I think um, thinking about you know future uh, kind of workshops that might focus on climate issues within the school, I think would be really fantastic for us to develop. So. Thank you for your presentations this morning. Question, or maybe an observation. An element that seems to be missing is the design of space. So I don't know what the, the per person square foot has been in residential, but I expect it's probably gone up substantially in the past generation. So it strikes me that one element to be included is um, rethinking the design of how people use and interact with space so we can do with less of it. Because presumably the, the, the way you get the least embodied carbon is just to have less needed and that requires less space. So observation or comment. James? You want to tackle that, Natalie? Or, or, no, 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 first. I already spoke. Yeah. 
Um, you're absolutely right. I, the first message I always have for clients is the single best thing you can do for the climate is build the smallest space that can accommodate your needs. And it is a, a, certainly a key element in, in our work. It just doesn't show up in the presentations on the technical side. And, oh. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, James. Yeah, sorry. Um, no, agreed. I mean, and if you look at it trends over the decades, that's absolutely true. I mean, I think the other thing that we're up against there is that space in our culture is understood as a commodity. It's not understood as a, uh, a place where you live so much. And, uh, you know, it, it, this is not exactly what you're saying, but like I was listening to a, a person who does envelopes for uh, kind of living, and he was saying that he can look at any building in a city and know if it's a condo or if it's a rentable apartment. If it's a condo, it's glass glass envelope, if it's a rentable apartment, it's a, a concrete or, or solid facade. And that's because the, the people building and selling the condo, they're not concerned with the operational energy. And I think it speaks to a larger attitude that we have about space in, 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 this, in this culture. Um, and uh, so there, I think there's a kind of cultural and political um, and governmental uh, uh, kind of facet to, to that dimension as well. But no, it's a really good point. If, if I could, to you, just um, advocating for the existing home side and the built environment, too. Um, so the fastest growing populations in Nova Scotia are indigenous communities. Population density in homes in indigenous communities is vastly different from that in, in non-indigenous communities. Um, so I'll, I, I mention that because you know we've got more people living in, in far tighter spaces in, in those communities, a housing crisis that we're not uh, used to looking at in other, other areas. Um, also, another point around um, maximizing the existing built environment is you know, we have a lot of spaces that we're not able to use as habitable space uh, because of like egress windows, but also because of resiliency issues, basements that flood. So we have to do more when we're retrofitting buildings to make sure that we're maximizing the usable space and protecting the built environment that we have in a way that makes it, uh, um, you know, in, uh, acceptable as an apartment or as for growing families um, before we just look at building new in the first place. Thank you so much for the presentations. Um, you just mentioned the indigenous communities, and I have a question. Uh, do, do you see, you already mentioned some unique challenges for, for their communities, but uh, do you have any special programs to engage them as homeowners and also as a uh, skilled workforce? Yeah. Are you asked? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so here in Nova Scotia, we have what's called the Mi'kmaq Home Energy Efficiency Program. Uh, so in terms of retrofitting existing space within a, in indigenous communities, it is an initiative that is uh, designed to retrofit all band-owned homes across Nova Scotia over about a 10-year period. Um, that, that sounds great. It is great when it works, you know. Uh, the, the problem is, like, the process of engaging and building relationships of trust in indigenous communities um, the funding and the, the will, uh, the kind of political will to make that change has come into place before we have that relationship you know, in a lot of cases. You know. So there are some communities that are uh, taking a lot of initiative. Uh, Annapolis Valley has had a couple um, like uh, oil leaks, scares from, from oil leaks in their community, and that's kind of started their, their um, path towards electrification from a different angle than um, you know, traditional GHG emissions. Um, as far as the workforce, um, we at CLEAN have created um, a series of clean energy and equity initiatives. Some of the members of that team are sitting just in the row in front of you. Um, but uh, uh, so a, a few different um, angles into engaging communities, African Nova Scotia and Mi'kmaq communities from across the province. That includes, um, first and foremost, creating a network of individuals that you get too many of the people making programs and designing initiatives look like me. Um, so creating a network of dedicated individuals from African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq communities that can sit at longer tables and help make decisions on, um, you know, bring their perspective and their need into the conversation as we're making these decisions in the first place. Um, we also have, um, in the new year, a, a series of, um, so that, sorry, that network will employ about 11 people from across the province to kind of provide more representation. Um, uh, in the new year, we have programs coming out, um, uh, custom employment supports, wage subsidy programs, uh, community-based education initiatives that will um, directly employ or support employment for a couple hundred people over the next few years. 
um, as well as engaging in education directly in communities with, with several hundred more. So um, it's something that we take really seriously at CLEAN. And uh, unfortunately, like, this started from building in a little bit of training and mentorship money within one budget. And then I always joke that I made the mistake of telling people about it, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it's something that everybody's really passionate about. Um, but uh, we just have to figure out better ways of putting it into action. So again, just like health and safety, building social equity in, as, a, as a lens through which you do work is, uh, is just something that we have to, have to do a better job of. Hi, just a very quick comment. It's super impressive just all the work that all of you are doing and just the great models and the emphasis on social equity and, and engaging communities is fantastic. Um, my question is about uh, scale up. Um, you mentioned things like um, labor force, uh, financing. Is there some sort of low hanging fruit in terms of getting things to a more system level? Um, any comments about um, what, what, what's the, what, what's the most promising things that you see in terms of scaling up some of this work? Um, maybe I'll tackle that and then I'll invite others. I, I think we have a lot of programs that encourage adoption. Um, incentives are always a great place to start and that's the low hanging fruit and it exists through Efficiency Nova Scotia and, and other other programs to incentivize the kind of change that we that we want to see. Um, what I always say to people with incentives, they're not going to last forever. You know, it's a way to, to kickstart uh, a change and um, it, the, so it's good in a way, it's bad in a way that it's often the people who can most afford to do the work themselves take advantage of the incentives that, it, that exist. So that's why programs like home warming that address um, low-income communities are really important to have that equitable lens to that because we don't want just early adopters to be the, the people who could be doing it anyway. Um, but I think that that's, you know, we need to... We need to change um, the kind of incentives that are offered, the, the funding models that are offered. And when you look at deep energy retrofits, there, it's a big, expensive proposition for somebody, you know, to go and say, you're going to retrofit your home and it's probably going to cost you fifty or sixty thousand dollars. Now we have CMHC coming out with a with a forty thousand dollar no interest loan, which which is great for for people, um, but it's still a disruptive process. Uh, it's still going to take time. It takes time to get approvals done. So there's lots of barriers in that, and I think um, there's lots of people who are trying to figure out how to how to get rid of those barriers and create more incentives and more um, environment for this kind of stuff to happen. Yeah. And Laura, do you just want to also just say something about workforce? Because that was also in the oh, question. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And so the, the other thing, and I guess because I work on collaborative models, just that there's, there's lots of work happening on developing that workforce and trying to identify what we're going to need. We know sort of anecdotally that energy modelers are, are going to be a gap um, because as the building code changes and we require an energy model in the building code, we don't have enough people to do that kind of work. So we know that gap is there, but we need to better understand the gap on solar installers, on carpenters. We need to understand the shift in trades, like are they new jobs or are they a shift of other jobs. One of the other conversations around workforce that I think is really important is this sort of climate literacy, that there's a baseline understanding of, of climate and, and, and the intention behind all of these things that we're talking about. So if you've got, you know, a, a guy who's been building houses in Pictou County for 50 years and he's been building them the same way all the time and he thinks we're just highfalutin environmentalists or trying to change the way he's doing, we've got to reach those people too and 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 how we how we um, encourage the workforce development that needs to happen and that that sustainability literacy I think is really important Natalie sorry yeah and, uh, oh, I and think Lori after you yeah that there's a really great example in uh, in Belgium where they went from zero passive houses to passive house being building code in five years and you know, we've, we've been, I've been doing this for 13 years, we're making some ground, but it's just not enough and it's not fast enough. So when you look at their example, what they did was they provided, uh, the government provided all of the energy modeling and the support services to 
to help people change to, to a passive house level construction. They provided very large incentives, about $45,000 on a single family house. They did all these really um, well publicized design competitions and if you won design competitions, your incentive doubled. So it just, everybody just jumped on board because they created so much energy around it with the level of incentives and the level of expertise and support they provided. And when they finished after their five years, they found that the passive houses they were building were actually costing less on average than the code built houses before they, they changed the code. But there is an expense to that transition and it is something that, uh, that uh, has to be invested in if we want it to move fast because organically we make, we make strides but they're just way too, too small um, and too slow. Um, so I would echo what Natalie said and that same like cost um, decrease has, has been proven in North America like the um, the larger affordable housing agencies in the big northeastern U.S. cities all insist on passive house as their um, as the performance level for buildings they build because they cost less to build, um, and that's the truth. That's because of efficiencies that they've learned. So, funding the transition is really what we should be thinking of because ultimately the business case will be there. Um, and so I wanted to talk about um, the workforce uh, transition with respect to recover. Um, in the federal project that we're working on, um, one of the things that we have uh, committed to is, um, is doing engagement in each of the cities that we're working in, uh, or in each of the provinces rather that we're working in. And so we'll be doing uh, knowledge dissemination workshops and um, and kind of uh, uh, inquiry as well to, uh, to to meet with contractors and building professionals in each location to, um, to first of all, we'll show them what we're doing with Recover and engage on what the barriers are from their perspective of implementing retrofits at scale. And, and we acknowledge fully that one of the biggest barriers is just that we don't have enough people. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's the money uh, and then there's the people. Like we, we already, as an industry, um, there's not enough design professionals and there's definitely not enough tradespeople. Um, and and uh, it's not lost on like the feds that that's the case. And so we're working on on um, motivating people to uh, get involved. Like I keep saying, we just need like a sexy TV show with builders doing retrofits. But usually, you know, all of the TV shows are like fraught with here's the big problems, not here's the here's the great um, performance. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so so that is something that we're working on. On, on our side of things, our tiny team. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I think, and sorry, I, it looks like I'm typing on my phone. I'm just making notes because I forgot my sketchbook. But I think the, the issue around incentives and, and disincentives is really important. And um, I think we get in our own way with the, with the laws and regulations that we have around so many built environment issues. Um, so I, I do a lot of work with the concrete industry and I have conversations with um, industry groups and, and with uh, concrete producers. And they tell me a lot of things that, that actually uh, disincentivize their ability to uh, lead and, and, and change their industry. And um, at, a, at a, a dinner recently, I was speaking with someone who was explaining that the Department of Transportation in every province sets the standards for, for uh, concrete mixes. Um, they only purchase about 5% of the product, but all the municipalities reference that standard. Um, so there's no incentive for the concrete company to change their mix design, because every time they do that, they have to go get more testing, they have to uh, it, it, get over a lot of hurdles to, to, um, to make that change. And some of those standards were basically established 30 years ago or more. Some of them were established by people who knew people in the testing agencies and, and needed to generate an industry around it. So that's one example of the kind of changes that we can look at is, is really understanding what, what are, where, what's the, the engine driving some of the, the way we make our built environment. Uh, around the issue of training, 
Um, we make a lot of hurdles for, for people who have uh, good ideas. Um, sorry if I'm going over time here, but you know, it's interesting to me that a lot of people leading um, in, in, we'll call it the green economy or, or the, the green built environment, aren't necessarily licensed architects. Um, it might sound strange for a person who, who trains architects for, for a living to say that we might need fewer rules <laughs> and fewer hurdles for someone to become licensed. Uh, you know, to the issue that there's a lot of buildings being made without architects, we might just have an architect supply problem and maybe not a, a, an owner, and so, you know, an owner problem. Uh, there's disincentives, and this speaks again to the question around indigenous uh, engagement and training that uh, there's, um, say, barriers to entry for, for uh, people who may have really amazing things to offer to, to our industry. So, um, on the flip side, government can incentivize. So, um, again, in conversations with the, the precast industry, um, I was at a, at a convention asking and in, in, in talking with someone very excitedly about uh, smart plants and, and precast plants that are, are fully automated uh, and have high efficiencies. And he was talking about, oh, we've opened our second one in North America. And I was like, well, why are there so few here? And he's like, there's no incentive. There's no incentive for us to be efficient. And, and all the innovations happening in Europe because the margins are so tight, because they have uh, a, f a few uh, kind of basic foundation designs that everyone has to adhere to. And so you're getting your, your profits from how, how efficiently you get the product out the door. Uh, and so that's incentivizing process efficiencies. So the, the, I, I think um, understanding uh, the, the legal system and the, and the um, kind of governmental uh, um, organizations and, and, and the internal organizations that, that license and, and uh, uh, train our, our workforce is really one of those kind of low-hanging fruits that we can move on. And Lori? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, from my perspective, in, it, we work mainly in part nine buildings, um, partly because we have four architecture graduates, but they work for an engineer, so they can't get licensed. Um, so, um, speaking to your, your, your point, but um, we've, we've worked with about 60 builders that have built a passive house for the first time, and it's not that hard. Um, and what we've noticed over the years is that it's the owners that drive it. So the owners have, are gonna build a house, they tell the builder it's gonna be a passive house. And the builders kind of come kicking and screaming to the table. And I, as a builder, can understand that. We have our methods, we know what works, we don't wanna change things because we're the ones that wear the callbacks and the problems if the new things don't work. But it, it, it really needs to be, the, the building industry will not lead the change because they have lots of incentive not to. Um, because they're the ones that are going to wear the problems, and what, it has to be the owners, whether it's whether it's the individual owners or big building owners or institutional owners, that will drive the industry. It's not that hard to do. It's just if they can go build a code-built building, or someone's asking them to build a passive house, and there's so much work right now, um, they will say, "Oh, well, I'll just build what I know." Yeah, and I think we need to address how we drive that demand. I agree with you 100%, Natalie. You know that that, uh, and and we hear it all the time from the trades. For example, they'll they'll say, "Well, we'll build whatever you want, but somebody has to be asking for it." So where are the barriers to the? W w you know, what are the roadblocks there for the building owners to to come to this? Is it we're not incentivizing the building owners? They don't have the uh, the pressure of a competitive advantage, or you know, there's lots of issues in this ecosystem that we have to crack. James, you wanted to Sorry. jump in. I'm, on that. I'm just gonna just cut you guys you off. Go, go ahead. The reality is, is this is a very complex nut to crack, and we could probably continue talking about it for hours. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of people working on it. There's a lot of exciting things happening, and there's a lot of things that still need to happen. Um, a, a big intention of this series overall is was to bring together a lot of the ideas and to bring together the people in the space who care and to start almost identifying some some ways forward identifying places where where Dalhousie might be offering new programming or opening up new areas of research where we as the municipality might think about focusing similarly clean and similarly lots of people in this space. So we want to just give a few minutes for that, again, this kind of crowdsourcing. 
Um, and I felt like I was interrupting your conversation was where it was still quite alive. So I feel like you could feel free to do this alone or with your partner, but I really want to invite each of you, I think when you came in, you got a little envelope with a couple of post-it notes and a marker. If you don't have one, I'll bring you one. Um, but we want to say like, is there still a question that you have and, and these kind of big questions that we need to answer? And is there some kind of idea like that you have of something that needs to happen that can really start to move us forward? Uh, again, we are planning to have a, a fifth culminating session um, on the, um, in the new year where we're gonna take some of these things that we hear and, and think about some next steps. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna give everyone a minute to, to write something down and then in, in just a moment, we'll kind of say a final thank you in closing. Everything that you case lives in one of the biggest things harder. It's, it's also harder to, we probably don't need to do as much of it. Like places like under the so when we first, when we built the first affordable passive house in uh, Canada, thanks to Natalie Leonard, uh, our CEO at the time said this is the way forward. So we built another one and we built, we renovated a third multi-unit. Then the government changed and, uh, uh, you know, things change. So I, I just want to leave everybody with this note. You as uh, voters, as citizens, have to hold the government accountable. We have a Bill 57 now that requires all government buildings to be built to net zero standards beginning in 2022. Um, I'm in a position that I have to explain to people every time uh, that there is climate change when a new leadership comes. And they say, you have to justify why you need a budget. And I tell them, just look outside, there's Fiona, right? So I think it's not, uh, you know, government, when we say government, it's made up of people like me, like uh, other, like uh, Jason Hollett and other people, but the politicians need to, um, be on board as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsey. And I'm just going to hand it to Graham. Well, um, thank you all. Uh, Laura, Rob, Natalie, Lori, James. Uh, this has been a fabulous session. Great ideas uh, that I knew uh, when we designed this that would come out today. Um, one observation, this is just a uh, perhaps being a, an engineer by training, uh, our first session was very much uh, an indigenous-led look at uh, climate change and sustainability, and it was a highly vigorous uh, emotional discussion. And today we had a very technocratic, practical <laughs> approach to this problem. Uh, our note-taking was incredible, and we got down to it. So it was, uh, it, it's nice for me, and I know for, for Shannon and Sarah to see all these reflections of, of this journey and I truly appreciate everyone's time, uh, professional time uh, to be here today and, and talk and debate and I'm sure you'll walk away thinking about this even further. So uh, before I, I give a, a more formal thanks, I, if we could have one last round of applause for everyone on the, uh, on the program. Thank you very much. Um, so my colleague uh, Zane has some uh, gifts for each each of you. Um, in it is a is a book. James probably won't need this book, but he, I'm going to give it to him anyways. It's on the free lab from uh, the Faculty of Architecture uh, and Planning. Uh, the, the free lab, of course, is a, a lab that our architects do every summer to, to look at projects in a very uh, sustainable and community-based way. Uh, and of course, a toque as well uh, for, for you to stay warm on this uh, very cold day. So thank you all very much, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the 16th. All the best. Yeah, and if you haven't put your post-it note on the flip chart, you can do it on the way out. Also, we are trying to be green and reuse our markers, so if you don't mind dropping your marker from your envelope in this little white box on your way out, um, thank you so much, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep you posted on the next steps.